Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mastiff Dads Having Coffee, talking about dogs. <laughs> good morning. Uh, wait, what? <laughs> good good <laughs> morning, afternoonish. Uh, it's been uh, a crazy week, and um, I'm I'm surprised we made it here on time. And uh, I know you were on the road and hurried back and stuff. Yeah. And uh, so glad to be here as always. I enjoy our, our cups of coffee. I see a mastiff lover in the far back. Who's that? You certainly do. That's my my little right hand man, Fisher Thompson. Fisher, can you say hi to everybody? Hi there. <laughs> he, he wanted to so, be on and. Uh, but uh, he's going to help get Harry in view when I need him to. Oh, uh, he's laying down, yes. and unless I point it on the floor, you can't, you know, you can't see him uh, very well. So, so we'll get him, we'll get him in the chat. We'll so him let's there. introduce ourselves. I'm Roman with Holistic Dog Training, and I'm a holistic behaviorist, and I am in Oregon, Albany for now. And next to me is Joe, multiple Mastiff parent, Mastiff advocate, the world's likely biggest dog lover of Mastiffs. I, I said it. I tried. And <laughs> we are talking today um, about the stuff Mastiffs are made from. I know I had no clue about Mastiffs. Mastiff was not in my terminology, even though I grew up in Greece and we have Molossa breeds, actually a Molossa herding dog, uh, which is basically a Greek sheep dog, similar to the Great Pyrenees, similar to Akba, similar to the Anatolian. It's basically the same breed line. It just comes in different versions and colors. And we have some different, um, you know, details in the breed description, but all of them have one thing in common, Mastiffs have the same lineage as those um, Molossa breeds. So what do we know about the Mastiffs from a history perspective, generally speaking? We, we know that Mastiffs has an ancient heritage. We know that they're likely um, brought in from Phoenician traders in the early sixth century before Christ. The Romans employed the dogs as a guardians, sheep and bodyguards people. And so we know that these dogs have been around for many thousands of years. And over that period of time, we, we recognize that um, those breeds are very special to us. So how did you end up with Mastiff breeds? Well, selective breeding to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some misconception um, also. You know, I asked a Mastiff historian, he's a curator of the Mastiff Museum, Steve Oifer, if I pronounce that correctly, okay. uh, if the Mastiff was indeed the first known domestic breed of dog. And he said there's no real way of knowing that, um, stemming from the Molosser or the Alpine Mastiff. Um, but again, there's, there's no real way to trace that, but as far as um, the first domestic breed of dog was, was the Molosser. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially what that means then, and this is something I really wondered about and wanted to dig into, would that essentially mean then that the Mastiff is closer related to the wolf than, say, a Husky, a Siberian Husky, which resembles the wolf much more than a Mastiff? But genetically, if the first known domestic uh, breed of dog was the Molosser, it came from the wolf, which would then say that the genes would be closer to being wolf than a Siberian Husky. I'm not sure on this, but, uh, but there's some great genetic people that study genes out there that might have some insight in that. It's very interesting for me to find out. Um, I'd like to know that. From because from yeah, my yeah, research. Yeah, yes, go ahead. From my research, hey, your, your son has TNT on his back. What's going yeah, on there? Like, <laughs> um, from, from, from my research, um, and uh, I, it was their books, and I don't remember exactly where I wrote it. It's, it's ancient Greek books. We know from 
the ancient Greeks that the Molossa breed was not the first breed that was domesticated. Okay, there so were what previous was breeds. We know that the Egyptians had breeds. We know that the Egyptians had actually gods that were, some people said it was shakal, some people they said, you know, they're dogs. We don't know exactly, exactly clear of the breed. We know that um, the ancients had contact to Sirius, to the planetary system. And they know that dogs and cats come from that direction. All of a sudden, if we make those combinations, we know about dogs as much long as we know about humanity. I, uh, I have a brother-in-law. Um, he's actually from Egypt and studies in this area. And one of the things we found very interesting, there are depictions of these Egyptians with dog and cat heads. There are exactly. also, there are also depictions with masks. He thinks that they came from an advanced civilization where Correct. you can actually put an animal head or your genes accomplish that. Now that's a little far out, right. but very interesting. I would say not. I honestly cosmetics and everything, you know, we do all this. He feels like in the and then there's also speculation that the the, um, the pyramids were gold making factories. That's what they were, and they had rivers that ran through, and they've done a lot of uh, uh, studies there. And just really interesting to see how much the Egyptians did revere dogs and cats. And there's got to be something more there that we just don't see or understand. Um, and I'm a firm believer that the things in life you can't see are the most important. So I agree. Yeah. Um, I've I've seen um, or I've heard of a story um, that the ancient Native Americans telling a story about how God created the world. So he created the world and then he created the dog and he put the dog on this earth for the dog to experience his creation. And then he added a human to the dog so he can get a better understanding of how emotions work. And because the first man didn't treat the dog well, he removed the first type of human and he added a second type of human, a better person. And it kind of like hit me a little bit because I was like, wait a minute. A dog created a dog, a god created the dog, and then created humans, and then the humans weren't good enough, so he took the humans back, put them in a better human, so they treat the dogs better. Why would the story talk about dogs? Why not about horses? Why not about goats, bears, or anything out that was obviously earlier there than the dog was? And it kind of hit me weird. And then I said, well, what do other cultures have to say? Far East. They have stories about animals and dogs. They have, the ancient Greeks have stories about dogs. The Mayan, the Incas, the um, um, Egyptians have stories about dogs. To tell a story as an advanced culture, there's a story behind that culture. If we talk about evolutionary knowledge and praising dog as a god or a cat as a god, meaning is there was something before that that made them to have that thought of putting that into equation. So if we talk about what stuff mastiffs are, I think it's an evolutionary process of something that we're not 100% sure. And I really don't believe that dogs evolved from wolves, at, not, at least not those wolves that we see outdoors. Um, let me, and I have been having a tremendous background in wolves and body structure, they're nothing like a dog. I've watched them develop. I've spent weeks with them in the woods photographing, watched right. them grow. And one of the things about summer wolves is they have short hair and you can really see what's going on. And their body structure is more like a white tailed deer than it is a dog. They're on stilts. They're not like they're hyena like it's not they're not really that dog like when you study them and watch them develop correct you know, if i would be if we look into into the ancestors like egyptians and we look in the greeks they have all these symbols of dna if those people know how dna looks like 
and we have gods talking about creation, then they know how to use it. You cannot just know things that are macroscopic small if you don't have a microscope. You cannot talk about ancient planetary systems if you have some something to look at. So there's some information coming in where we have no clue about. I don't see a problem for those people back then in time to do genetic modification, no problem. So if I want a companion for a human that is the man's best friend, that is capable of helping him, supporting him, and we have, let's say, some energies out there on some civilization outside of a planetary system that want to help humanity, I would like to be a dog on that system, being free, being able to, to survive on my own, being able to be social, communicate with others. And that then becomes a common journey. Why is the dog the man's best friend to start with? How did we end up having a dog as a man's best friend? Uh, because twenty below nights can get pretty rough. And as beautiful as nature seems to be, and is it's very 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 hard for animals to make it through a winter uh especially being a predator um just it's very difficult and i think through you know way back dogs or wolves or wherever they you know relied on humans for that little bit of of compassion and stuff so they probably hung out on the outskirts of fires and got scraps and over time became to look at the human being as as helpful um, so, you know, as much as the dogs give us, uh, great things, I think that we give them, um, a great life because being wild and free is great, but it's very, very difficult. Um, there's not an easy winter for any animal anywhere. Um, it's, it's tough. So, um, um, and then another interesting thing I wanted to point out, they did a study with red foxes hmm. on a farm and... They took all the nice tempered foxes and they would breed those ones. They ended up getting floppy ears and different color patterns. Okay. Then they, then they only the ones they could not touch, the ones that were still really leery of humans, and they only bred those. They retained the red fox color and they retained the pointy ears. Explain that. Why is during the process of domestication, why does that? And right there is a correlation between behavior and a physical trait. They're connected no matter what, what we think, because in that study, it's a famous study. I studied in college. I don't know the exacts, but it's a very interesting one to read mm -hmm. um, because they bred due to temperament only. And by breeding the nice ones, they ended up with white patches and floppy ears and stuff on these red foxes. And then they bred only the, the, the wilder ones that they couldn't touch, and they retained the wild red color pointy ears. Very interesting. Yeah, well, unfortunately, um, there is a controversy about how, um, you know, the Soviets created this tame fox and, you know, what the studies behind that. Uh, I remember um, back in the years, like in BBC, and I think in 2016, they did a whole article about that domestication and and how it goes through that process. Um, I, I feel when, when we're looking at our domestication and how we want the dogs to, to do that domestication, we're looking at the certain traits. And in order for the dog, uh, for the dogs or, or, or fox to show those, it has effect on his environment. If a dog, if a fox behave a certain way, he would not be able to survive on his own. If a fox has certain traits, he will be able to survive. So if we see the evolution of a species, it's not about who is cuter, who is faster, is who survives, is able to transfer that information. So in that absence to surviving or even to thrive is the way to go. Don't look at the humans. We basically, we're not getting there for some weird reason. We're going backwards. But anyway, what, we, what I try to say here is that even with breed traits, only the ones who had specific traits based on their environmental factors and the way they were able to process the environmental factors and the way they're able to communicate with humans is the ones who survived in the human environment. And the other one just fell off.
it's naturally falling off. So going technically and try to breed a dog to comply, it doesn't come with evolutionary process of self evolving because it's technically evolving and doesn't include the genetic knowledge behind that. You are right. And it's not a survival uh, issue because of the man's involvement. Um, so it definitely makes sense. Um, right. Yeah, yep. Um, and again, I'm not a scientist um, by far. However, I would say we have to be very careful how we digest science. We can go extremely science. We can say well, science in the past said the earth is flat and people got killed and tortured for it. And then science said, well, the earth is round and everybody was killing and torturing for that. And now we say the earth is not actually just alone. We have other earths out there and other people got suffered about that. And some people says, yeah, we can leave earth and go somewhere else. And they were burned on, on the poles and the books are burned. So we see that science, we cannot take absolute. Science is no. here is, is trying to confirm something that doesn't, it's not easy to comprehend, but science is not that that leads us to evolution. It's the path cutters, and they all go beyond that science and question things and ask questions. The pioneers are the one who brings us forward. But the science is here to kind of create that solid foundation. The science always evolves. And mm -hmm. I see that especially around breeds, we have these, these fights about, oh, the science says, and the science says, well, let's look at that science at some point the science says this and another science says that about the same subject now who is right why isn't the science saying the same thing no matter how you do that because we com we confuse science with proof newton newton left the ball and that the apple and it fell down and says that's that's a law I like Newton. He said uh, the object right. in motion tends to stay in motion and an object at rest. Exactly. In. I use and that all the is, time. And when we teach leash classes, we go exactly to that point. A dog that wants to be in motion, he stays in motion, especially a 250 pound mastiff. Yeah. What do you do there, right? Anti gravity. <laughs> um, if, I, if I stop doing it, that's one of the things I cannot stress enough. You cannot make weekend warriors out of mastiffs, it's not going to work. It needs to be very light every day. I don't go out to go, hey, can I hurt my dogs today? Can I see what they can do? That's not, I know what they can do. Um, I do very light and I do it every day, daily, getting those elbows moving, telling the body, this is what I have to do every day. It enhances everything about how they move and how they feel. And um, and, and speaking speaking of that, if if we see that, evolution is happening because the body gets this information from the external factors and puts him in his body memory. That That's memory is being transmitted to the further dogs, which leads us to our, the stuff mastiffs are made of. So a mastiff is not, let's say a cup is not what that is. I can do a cup whatever I want. I can have a cup taking dog food off, out of the food bag. I can take the cup to measure raw food. I can take a cup drinking beer or, mm -hmm. you know, drinking coffee. What I do with that cup is what makes the cup, whatever it is. So if we take a Mastiff and I try to push the Mastiff in a situation where he's not used to, his DNA has to adjust for him to survive. Yeah, and then not. if I breed that Mastiff with this survival instincts that he already has into it and his and his experience has been stored in his body as a positive or negative experience it goes down to the genes <coughs> we know that genetics are being transmitted up to 17 generations later can show up so if we have a consistency of a specific breed traits is being again and again shared and shared and shared down the line it can pop up at some point now the question is, will that dog who showed that popping up information survive? Will he be able to transmit that information to the next generation? Then it's confirmed a successful change. And yes. that's his sealed. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not a scientist. It's just for me a common sense because I see microcosmos equals macrocosmos. We learn. Right. I use that term microevolution because here's an example. 
you know, like when Ringo was a puppy and once in a while, you know, we'd be outside and he'd get red ears and he'd shake his head and I knew something was bothering him. Now, instead of running to the vet and slapping him on some kind of anti, uh, you know, allergy thing, I kind of let him gradually get used to his environment. And I believe inside his body, he now possesses the ability to not be allergic to these things. And I think that that should pass an offspring along with some of the other things. Um, because think of how many generations of cells live and die in your body. You know, you're looking at thousands, if not, I don't know how many generations of cells go through your body, but each time it changes and it adapts to whatever situation you're in, similar to cowboys being in the sun, they have a very low rate of skin cancer. Their skin is used to it. They've over time. And so I really strongly do believe that some of this stuff comes from the individual and and can be passed or at least be the beginnings of, of something that can make a, a more solid, uh, well-rounded dog. Um, that's that's the goal. I, I totally agree with you. One other thing that I want to say is that we have to be very clear that genetics does not make a Mastiff. It, oh. it creates a baseline, yes. Exactly. So yes. I would say what I researched so far, the, the, the information varies between 42% genetics and 58% environmental Environment. factors is what makes more. the dog's personality but some other science says no 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 it's not so little it's about 60 percent genetics and you know 40 percent environmental factors and i was like if that would be the case i would not be able to modify a mastiff in his individual behaviors because otherwise most mastiffs will behave like mastiffs but they if don't. Allowed, yes, if allowed, you betcha. There's right. no doubt my dogs would lay on their tuchus all day if I didn't make them or if something didn't happen where they duty, you know, duty calls. Otherwise, they're pretty laid back. Um, and even even when working them every day, you know, the first half hour, they're like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to do this. Sucks. They, you can just tell they just aren't into it there. But after this little bit, and they start to smell things and they they almost like they engage. They just, and that's the warm up period. Um, and once they get in that zone, man, are they focused and just, it's amazing to watch them do what they do on their own accord. They're not listening to me. They're, they're teaching me a lot. Um, if I watch my dogs, I know what's going on in those woods far more than anybody else. It's like having a crystal ball. And when you think of a dog, when they smell another dog or animal's track, uh, canines in specifics, right. a, wolf, a wolf can tell the age of another wolf by smelling the tracks. Uh, there's glands mm -hmm. on the feet. They can tell the size, sexual maturity. Uh, and so in a sense, a dog can see the past, the present, and the future because he can smell what's up ahead. He knows what just happened, and he can smell what happened back then. So you get this. when It, it can make you just an amazing person in the woods um, if you learn to watch the signs and, and allow – you know, your dog to teach you as much as you're trying to teach them. And in the woods, the, the biggest thing for me is obedience because I want them to be near me and I don't want them getting in trouble. Um, I want them visually uh, visible at all times. And we talked about this and I accomplished that by when they're pups and they decide they want to lead, I go hide on them. Oh, it can turn a half hour walk into a three hour production, but yeah, Each yeah. time he tries to push that boundary, I go hide behind a rock and I will not move until he finds me. And that creates this always looking for me um, environment. And, it, and in the woods, my dogs don't get more than 30 yards away from me. Um, and they figure that anything beyond that isn't much of a danger. So they kind of, yeah. they circle as I walk through the woods. They're, all, one, they're always doing this. And it's so even when I do like three miles, I have to take into consideration that they've done much more. And and I keep that, uh, you know, I try to do five miles a day, uh, depending on the heat. If it's real hot, I'll do a little less. And then, of course, uh, the end of every exercise regime ends with a, a fun swimming event where I let them just go swim and play and be what they are and relax, lay in the water. And uh, that's become a really, you know, you can tell when we're about, you know, maybe a block or so a couple blocks from the river they perk up and they just take off and 
they hit that water like a Mack truck. It's just neat to be a part of. <laughs> so um, let's talk about a little bit. What are, how can we define a, a breed trait? Okay, let's talk about a little bit. So from what I researched so far, we can clearly identify nine breed traits. The first one would be activity level. The second one would be destructability. The third one would be intensity, regularity, sensory Freedom. threshold, approach and withdraw, adaptability, persistence, and mood. So if we look at the Mastiffs and we look at the activity level, they are how? How do you define a Mastiff in his activity level? Uh, I would say laid back, um, close quarters guardian, meaning when duty calls in a confined area, they can kick some major ass. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't find that 100% uh, guard dog. I want some a dog that if I ended up, somebody stole me and was 30 miles away, that he'll run over the mountains to come and get me. I want him to be able to keep up with me. I don't want a dog where... You know, I got a four mile walk into the shack that I got to worry about them being able to make it or not. Dogs should be superhuman. Their muscle density exceeds ours to a great degree. Uh, similar, you know, you could take a 200 pound gorilla and a 300 pound boxer and that gorilla would rip that guy. You couldn't even hurt. They're very superhuman, but it's a gradual thing that you can't just suddenly have a four year old mastiff and say, hey, let's go hiking five miles up the mountain. That's not going to work. It wouldn't work for me. So, so you have activity levels that are very low or activity mm -hmm. levels that are very high. And I feel from a, a Mastiff perspective, we have two basically, let's, let's include that for a moment. As original dog traits, we have two basic traits, hunters and guardians. And from there, we kind of split up in more, more individual um, ideas. So I feel the Mastiffs in the very core is either a hunter or a guardian as a core breed trait. I agree. And Steve, Steve O has, has told me that within the lines themselves, there's a distinct difference and he knows which mm -hmm. lines are known for this hunting and which lines are more known for the close card, uh, close uh, guard, quarters guardians. And, um, and this is what makes a huge difference. The way they connect with people. A guardian I, want both. A I, want, I want both. I want both close quarters guardian and one that can can go wherever I go. If I can't do it, I don't around her. Yep. I want it both. So the next thing we're going to look for in the breed traits is destructibility. How easy or the degree of concentration and focus that a dog can display on what he's doing or can display while working with you in person. Or how how in how external stimuli can interfere in his ongoing behavior. Like, how does a dog being distracted of what he's doing? Now, we call dogs, Mastiffs especially, stubborn. Oh, my Mastiff is less stubborn, like all the Mastiffs. And I was like, no, he's not stubborn. That's a breed trait. He's not easily distractible. In addition to that, which be my, uh, one of the other things that we're gonna talk about is how intense he is on what he's doing. And mastiffs are very intense animals. Yes. So his energy level of a response is either positive or negative. Either way, he does it very intense. He's intense guardian. He's an intense couch potato. No, yeah. I said it. Yeah. Right? Um, but we have also to be very careful that each one of those remarkable um Temperament traits have also one factor that can destroy the whole thing, which is trauma. If in any one of those breed traits we have a trauma involved, those breed traits go in the red zone. And we have to be very careful. If a dog behaves unnaturally to his breed trait, we have likely to suspect that something happened that triggered that to go into the red zone. The other I thing that we have... Um, is intensity and the other one is regularity. How regular is a Mastiff? As a working dog, we want that regularity. We want the dog to be persistent and regular and intense in what he's doing as long as he's doing what he has to do. So 
you wake up in the morning, you have the same master that you have last day because he will consistently do the same thing all over again because it's freaking works. Yep. And they're very predictable. Once you know your dog's personality, it's, it's pretty, it's, you know, you, you, each one is different without a doubt. Um, as far as all of those things you mentioned, um, intensity and focus and all of these things, they're just, they're a lot like people where, where there, there's a lot of varying degrees within the breed. Um, but one thing's for certain, they remain very focused at whatever it is they're doing. Um, they're very predictable. Uh, you can count on them. You can trust them. Um, that's one of the things when I looked at, you know, just personally, what kind of breed I wanted for my family. I wanted a dog that I never, ever worried about biting one of my kids or doing something like that. And um, although it's happened in the Mastiff breed, it's not very common. And again, it's usually a trauma-based situation or he's in an environment that he probably shouldn't be. Um, you know, if I'm going to have a hundred people over to my house to have a big keg party, I'm not going to let my dogs run around and be subject to trying to watch all of those people, trying to assess all of those people, trying to please all of those people. Right. It's just, I, he go that my dogs would go into a nice quiet place, um, where they're not going to be subject to a lot of that. So I hear a lot of times, you know, well, I had a Christmas party you know 50 kids and some kid pulled my mastiff's tail and he bit him well but just you know respect the breed you know no, it, they shouldn't do that but it, it happens you sneak up on somebody or something like that and if the mastiff w was trying to hurt somebody they would and there's a strong difference between a dog that has a, has bitten someone or a dog that continuously bites someone um, and that's where you need before euthanization or before anything. And that's why I send a lot of people to you, Roman. Um, oh, I appreciate that. I do. I, it's not my area of expertise when it comes to trauma because I don't traumatize my dogs. I, I just don't, I put them right next to me as part of my family and I want them to be part of my family in the same way my kids and everything else are. So, um, you know, with all that been said, that's there, you know, I don't immediately go, you know, when you have a 240 pound dog, it can't be biting people occasionally or not, but there isn't, there is a difference between a dog that got surprised or was put in a terrible situation that reacted poorly versus a dog that just is a biter or continues to bite. Um, so, and I think that with a person like you, it's very possible to understand and remedy a dog that has bitten and sometimes maybe ones that can, you know, and you have experience there. I think you, you own quite a few rescues um, that had behavior issues and they don't seem to have those issues with you. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we, we have, we have, we will talk about trauma. I think we should dedicate a whole, a whole section about talking trauma because I know many people and uh, Catherine, we're going to um, answer your question. I know many people who are not aware that their dog is traumatized. They don't, they're, they're getting very defensive. If we talk about trauma, if I see certain behaviors, I can see the pattern of that. And it says, your dog is traumatized. I never traumatized my dog. How dare you suggesting that? And I was like, whoa, you know, trauma doesn't come because of your behavior. Trauma comes from a dog's perspective. Trauma comes genetically. Trauma comes before even the dog was born. You don't have effect on that, or you do have an effect on that. We don't know until we research it further. And I'm speaking from my own experience because I'm, I'm a person with trauma before even I was born. <laughs> to tell you some more detail, because we have to kind of understand that it works. My parents had a car accident when I was in my mother's womb. I had no clue about that. I was born years later. I have, I had hard time passing accidents. I got very emotional about it to the point that I had to literally get off my motorcycle, go to that incident. Even if the police officers and fire department was there, I could not walk away from it to the problem that I, I, I went to a psychologist and I said, you know, I have a problem. I'm not able to walk away from it. And she said, let's look into that. So we did kind of like uh, a specific modality. And she said, well, 
you had experience of death before you were born. And I was like, what are you talking about? I have no clue about that. So I went to my aunt because I couldn't talk to my mother back then. And she said, well, nobody talks about that. But yes, your father and mother had a car accident and a person got killed. And Ain't I was like, strange, the spiritual connection. Yeah. That... And I was like, what the bark are they talking about? And now it makes totally sense. If generations can, if a trauma can affect your genetic code and that information goes down the, the, the line, I am experienced a trauma that my parents had experienced a trauma. And the ancient Greeks says, Amartias Gorneon Pedevus in Tecna. I know it sounds smart, it's Greek because I'm it Greek. Does. I was impressed right off the right. bat. So it says that Say that again. One more time. Amartias Gorneon Pedevus in Tecna. Meaning is the undone things of parents are affecting their children. <laughs> Amartia is, is also translated as sin in the religion, but also Amartia is the undone. So undone things affect children. Parents undone things affect children. It's sad to say that things that people or parents didn't handle out of their trauma will be transmitted to the children that they have to deal with it. And going down that road, if an animal has a trauma, is being transmitted generationally down to the breed lines. In that aspect, if I cause trauma to my dog in one way or the other, what I create is I create a trauma that is being transmitted to the next generation unless I be able to clear it. You know, and here's an example of that. If if you get a perfect, you know, well, not a perfect, but you buy this breed of dog and you ruin it by, by abusing, hitting the dog, and you bred that dog, chances are the puppies will be skittish. They'll be, you know... And that is direct to me, direct evidence that that it does get past. There's a reason these skittish lines exist. There's a reason this fear is there. And it does stem from previous generations. I'm almost sure of that, you know, it's strange, but, you know, you, you come from a line of, of, you know, men's men, you just end up that way. You just, you're, it's there. You have that same, you know, so it's very, it's evident to me, but again, with science, it's a, a lot of educated guessing, um, things that, that make sense. And that is why you can't put 100% faith in science. Um, it just, there's so much that you cannot tangibly see under a microscope that you don't understand unless you, you do this kind of stuff. And that's why it's important that if we have a dog and that experience trauma, we want to make sure that we'll be able to heal that trauma. And there are techniques, we're going to talk about that specifically, to have that dog experience a new version of an outcome of a situation that caused him a trauma. So we don't pulling it down the generation, especially for breeders. It's very and, important. And you believe that can be nullified. So a, an abused dog that was consistently abused intentionally you feel that it's possible in some cases to restore their love and trust with humans? <coughs> or is it always something? I would, I would say as a quick answer, yeah, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I love it. I, I would be able to, identify, uh, to to break it down in individual sections. But I would definitely, you know, do a session, uh, do, do, a, do a show here, talk about trauma a little bit. Uh, a, because I have my personal experience, B, because a specialist in trauma, and C, I need I need peers and breeders and trainers and veterinarians to see trauma as a reality. The military recently took breed trauma and trauma as a war dog as a problem, and they uh, said, well, obviously we have PTSD in dogs, and everybody's like, what? Dogs can have PTSD, and suddenly people said, oh, wait, dogs have emotions? Same as we do. You just can't, yeah. they can't say it, but it's there. We read it all over so their face. If, if we look then further down into um, those temperament traits, we also recognize that regularities, intensity, sensory threshold, and those are also part of a trauma experience. And let me explain to you how trauma works in the genetics. A dog who survived and found a solution to his problem 
is the one who transmits generational information, generational code. The dog who didn't have a good experience with trauma and didn't survive it is dead. That information is gone. So what information do we have in real life dogs? We have experience that doesn't cause trauma because it's being worked away. The dog always finds a solution. And if it wasn't for him to be killed, it was for him to have an experience. Him getting away from there and surviving is a good experience for yeah. him to store. And it's a good thing to pass down survival. Right, right. How do I survive the fight with a wolf? Because of my techniques, because of my awareness, because of my regularity, because of my sensory threshold, because of my withdrawal and approach, because of my adaptability, because of my persistence, because of my mood, because of my intensity, because of my destructibility, and because of my activity level. That what made me survive that fight with the wolf, because I'm a guardian. Imagine a dachshund in that situation. Well, you know what? A dachshund has other types of activity levels, a different type of destructibility. And don't get me started with beagles. And don't be get nice, me started. A, a nice right. sausage for the wolves, that's for sure. Right? And so there we have this, this distinction code that out of those breed traits that, that actually shape that particular breed. And we haven't talked about color yet. So what we see is a shape of a dog that looks the same, but it's that's one particular area of a gene that gives that information. The rest is information that comes in generational and is being fine trimmed and fine tuned through emotional experiences that happen throughout the breed life. So what affects the dog's uh, personality? His genetics information that makes him be a breed. And then we have these environmental factors that he's being able to work around that. And of course, our, our work today is to see what kind of, what is a Mastiff? What kind of, let's say, quality is it? These are the qualities that the dog has. And I, I repeat them again, because I would like you to kind of imprint it. Activity level, and we're not saying either way, but it's essential activity level, destructibility, intensity, regularity, sensory threshold, approach and withdraw, adaptability, persistence, mood. And then we have a temperament rating, like is a dog easy and flexible, which is likely 40% of the Mastiffs, or is it a dog who is kind of like more difficult and hard dog, we call them also, which is about 10% of those Mastiffs. And then we have other dogs who are slowly to warm up a fearful dogs, which is about 15% of those Mastiffs. So we cannot just go and correct the dog because he's a jerk, because he's a beep or he's a beep beep, right? It'd be a beep 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 for me. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> so we have to make sure that when, when we're talking about those breeds, we have to see that it is eventually genetic. It could be medical reason. It could be an experience or a trauma. Um, a lot of so people have, said, have came to me and said, you know, my dog suddenly is acting this way or, you know, very irritable or whatever. And the first thing I tell them is, you know, is there something wrong? Sometimes an underlying reason um, can do that. They're very, you know, if they're, if they're sick, if they're something deeper uh it'll definitely change how they how they you know what they do every day and how they treat you so that's step number one if someone says hey there's been an abrupt change in my dog's behavior i try to look at the outside sources and then you know like hey did you get a new dog what's going on there's have you changed anything if the answer is no then i say you know Maybe just take them to a vet and have a, a wellness check because a lot of times that's a dog's only way to tell you, hey, I got cancer growing or, hey, I got something's, you know, they don't know how to tell you. And so a lot of times being crabby or whatever can, you know, it's an underlying health reason. So. So what else do we have with, with dogs? Um, I say what does your perfect Mastiff parent look like? Because right now we talked about the Mastiffs and these breed traits and all this blah, blah. 
how does a perfect mastiff look like if you would adopt one of your dogs out um or you would be adopting a dog what qualities you should have as a person to have a mastiff like well, let, let let me push some buttons here is it oops is it important for you to be the boss is it for you important to be the pack leader is it important for you to be the alpha is it important for you to be a dog parent what kind of person is that person? In general, dealing with animals, you know, and unfortunately, well, there, there's a lot of different types of people out there, but uh, in general, calmer individuals do much better with dogs in general, especially large breeds and, and mastiffs. I always tell people, you know, if you're an avid soccer player, you might want to maybe get like an Irish setter or a, a dog that, you know, is very, so you try to match your personality to the dog. Not, and it doesn't always, I've seen so many tiny people with these giant dogs and it's just cool. Um, and I don't necessarily mean the physical part of, of the similarities. It's, it's what kind of person are you? What kind of dog, what kind of lifestyle do you have? Um, now a Mastiff can be a good jogging partner, but not if you're training 10 miles every, I mean, and you'd have to you have to build them to that. There's much you know if you're a runner jogger, there's probably better dogs suited for your lifestyle. Um, so I like to see you know a laid back individual that's got patience because if you don't have patience with mastiffs, you're not going to have a very good experience. If you're a person in a in a rush a lot, expect to be late. Um, even right down to their size, you stop at a gas station and you got to be at an appointment in 15 minutes. You better get in and get out because everybody who sees them wants to meet them and say hi, and you end up at a gas station for 45 minutes. So it's one of those things where, you know, being a patient individual, I believe, is something that I really like to see in an owner. Um, but like I say, I do think that Mastis would make a great dog for anybody, provided you're willing to invest that time and patience into teaching him about his life and what he what's going to be expected out of him throughout his life and things like that um the biggest thing is you know all you need is love um if you love your dog and you there's always people out there that can help you there's people out there that can steer you in the right direction we have resources all over um to in every facet um so i do believe that um you know it's a personal choice but you should try to match the breed to your life. Um, there's a, a lot better breeds out there for long distance uh, stamina. Mine, I built to be the way they are. They didn't come that way. Uh, I didn't just grab Ringo and go five miles and start swimming. They, I had to teach them and slow process. But it, 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 I stand behind. It, it was one of the things that I want to show people what the breed can do if done right, if done at their pace. Um, a Mastiff's not a dog that's going to work at your pace. He's going to work at his. He's limited to... That, his. that persistence we were talking about. Yes. And they won't give up. A Mastiff will collapse and die for you if you push him. And that's why I just subtly watch um, watch their behavior when, when we're in the field. You know, a lot of times, Paul, he'll just sit down. That's a sign that, hey, I'm getting tired. I need a break. My, my butt's hurting and Need it? Need a few minutes, and I I give them that. Up. Sometimes fifteen minutes. I'll have a hard roll and let them roll around in some water hole, and then we'll keep going. Um, it's like I say, I'm not out there to hurt or break my dogs or or anything. It's it's letting them be what they are and do what they what they want to do. I don't push them. I don't dictate when we're going to get somewhere. Um, you know, if you're the kind of person I got to be there at three, they're not the breed for for you. <laughs> right before you leave. The house, it's just, one of those things. Um, so it, it it's, but again, they, they fit a lot of lifestyles, but I don't like to see a Mastiff kind of being, you know, they need to, to some kind of exercise every day or those joints won't get the right fluids and won't get the right stuff. You got to engage them for an hour a day, every day, and you're going to end up with a much healthier uh, Mastiff that walks with intention, that's very confident, doesn't waddle, um, gets up and lays down, you know, when they can, 
have good muscular control and stuff. They, they, they're they able to lay down nice and slow, hence preventing hygromas and growths from their elbows. When a dog is just meat, a big sack of meat, he can't lay down slow. He goes, like I do. I don't sit down in a chair. I throw myself into the... I even go, look at you, you lazy. I can't even sit down. <laughs> I fall into the chair. I don't gently sit down. Um, and so they're... There's the, there's the difference. And, and so every little bit of that helps. And when you're considering a large breed that you hope to see get up to 14, 15 years, or, you know, hopefully more someday. I, but, you know, I'm being as realistic as I can. Every step of the way, uh, having a place to sleep with memory foam, all of it adds up towards the end result, which is having an active dog at 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. I um, agree. There you go. So... And, and time will tell, you know, Ringo's pushing eight and he outperforms the other two hands down. I just cannot get over that dog and, and, and what, how he's been doing and how he's aged. And, and, uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, hopefully he lives to be 150. And if not, I might cryo freeze his head or do some of that adamantium Wolverine metal in him or something, but I'll, I'm going to figure it out. I'm working heavily on preserving Ringo for forever. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but I'm going to try. Yeah. So one thing that I always say to uh, my, my clients and mentees when we work on, you know, behavior stuff, I said, if you want to work with dogs and we, you want to change the dog's behavior, you have to master your emotions. Because especially as guardian breeds, and we're going to answer also the question that somebody asked before, the difference between a close guardian and a guardian. A guardian has this ability to recognize emotions that he has from his partner. How does my partner feel like? If my partner is fearful, I have to guard. If my partner is confident, I'm cool. If I have to observe somebody who's entered my space and he behaves like predatory, he feels predatory, this is where I have to step in in my job. So the job description is feel emotions, separate between fear and anger, between frustration and confidence, and then make your decisions that you're supposed to do based on the family code of conduct or your job description. And why I say family code of conduct is because we know that dogs feel themselves in that family as part of the family. And I compare it with mafia, with the idea of the mafia. I am part of the family. I am the family. Without the family, I'm nothing kind of thing. And if the family has a problem, I have a problem. And if I have a problem, family has a problem. So it becomes these complex things that there, there is a dog who is perfect for his family without ego. Whatever he does, it, it, he does it because of the family's safety and well-being that he's part of. No matter what he does, he doesn't do it from personal gain. Once he bonds with the family, once we bond with whoever he has a secure attachment or relationship, he would do everything for them that makes that person feel good. Now, this this brought, brings me back to something you brought up earlier, and it's just uh, something I've noticed all my life. But you had said, um, you know, that God put the dog here first and all of these things. And when you think of what God asks out of people, which is no hate, no bigotry no you know all of these things and a dog doesn't have any of those things he doesn't hate he doesn't hold ill will he doesn't lie he doesn't do the he does so it's it's fitting that they would and then why is dogs god dog backwards is that some kind of i was writing it the other i just and i'm not trying to be a weirdo but is that coincidence or is, I mean, what's going on there? It's just crazy to me. I just think it's nuts. But um, if I could, if I could conduct myself like Ringo at all times, I'd be the world's finest gentleman. And that's that. So yeah. they don't seem to have the ability to sin, which is strange to me. So from my perspective, what, what the, perfect passive parent would look like is somebody who's conscious about his actions. Somebody who treats his animal like animal with the human 
state of mind, being humane to animals. And I've seen a script, an ancient Greek script that tells us how to treat animals. It says very clear, I think it was about 300, 300 BC, treat horses, animals, and all the animals in your environment like you would treat humans. So we have that knowledge thousands of years in the past, and then we push it down the drain because all of a sudden the idea came up that animals are here to serve us. They are servants. What the bark? What Why the would bark? an animal, right? What Why the would the bark? Animal... I'm going to start using that all the... I love it. I've, <laughs> now I've, I've got it. What the bark are you talking about? And I don't even what? use the beep for that, right? It's totally clear. That's so, so we perfect. make sure that we... we, we we treat animals like equal species that had the same right to do things as we do. So if we go down back to the animal, uh, to the mastiff, how do I treat an animal? I have to treat him fair because an animal like a mastiff has a high sense consciousness of justice. Big time. I behave that mastiff differently than the other mastiff. The other mastiff says, why? Yep. Jealousy he doesn't, he doesn't say why me. He doesn't say why me. He says, what does he do to deserve that, which is not in alignment with what everybody's supposed to do? And then you see dog fights. Because if I expect for my mastiffs to come and sit and stay, and somebody is obnoxious jumping around like crazy, my dogs will like look at me and look at the dog. It's like, are you going to stop that or, or should we take over? And I don't respond accordingly. They will take over because somebody has to stop it from happening because they have that sense of justice to be compliant with the family code of conduct. You have an established family code of conduct. You're going downhill very quickly. And you're one of those people saying, well, you cannot do two breeds from the same sex in the same household. Yes, you can. But if you don't create those rules and you don't teach morals and ethics, you get zero out of it. I and agree. sometimes your dog will fail. Is it you a know. general term? I would say no, it's not the general term. Because in fact, you cannot just compare a rescue that you just pulled in from a shelter with your dog that you grew up since a puppy. So there are two differentials here. We have trauma involved. We have past experience involved. We have missing information involved. The dog grew up without proper information. So we cannot compare those two things together. However, you can help them catch up speed to that level, a little bit slower than average. Sometimes you can or not, but just saying, I cannot adopt two dogs from the same sex in my household. is just a wrong statement. It, it, it really is environment and the way you learn to treat your dogs. Yes, we know yeah. from bull mastiffs that are bred to, you know, to hate the same sex because blah, blah, blah. Yes, but that happened yeah. a couple of centuries, like hundreds of years ago, and that is when bred out. Yet sometimes it will come up, but you be careful of that. That will be the exception, but that's not the rule. I know many shelters and many um, uh, rescues who do not adopt same-sex dogs in existing families. That's the rule. You have a dog, the same sex, you don't get one other or the same sex. But I think we shouldn't judge the rescues either because not many people have that level of knowledge than we, you, me, and most of the people have to be yes. able to identify those triggers and recognize what the problem is and start filling the gaps with information and knowledge. Because I'm not talking about dog training here. I'm talking about dog and breed education, teaching the dog his own breed traits to be able to manage and be in the green zone, not in the yellow zone, not in the red zone. So let me let me tell you yeah. an interesting thing about um, dog fights um, and things like that. Uh, one of the things, if, if, and it doesn't happen very often, but it does, and it's never, uh, like I said, I've slow motioned it and they don't even touch each other. It's just a, a display of the gorilla who's going to um, type a deal. Uh, even in slow mo, they're like close, but they don't even touch. I'm going to have to play it someday. Um, but anyways, just picture this scenario. Paul and Harry get into it out in the yard because I'm petting Harry too much and in front of Paul and making him feel like crap or whatever. Uh mm -hmm. And they get into this pissing match. And I feel helpless because you can't, there's two ways to stop it. 
and one is unique. So I'm down there and I'm helpless and I feel alone and I can't get them to stop. I can't, you can't stop them. Uh, I got no water access. I, it's just one of those things. And then out of the corner of my eye, this dog swoops in and breaks it up like that. His name is Ringo. Just to know that I had that over and they just go, oh, shoot. <laughs> and it's that's one way, but I can't always rely on him. The other way, guess what it is? I scream and run the other direction. Breaks a fight up like that, and suddenly they're going, what's wrong? Is Joe okay? They're back into their job, and I don't do it by yelling loud. I run away like a coward. It looks funny, but it works. It stops them immediately. Done. Let's talk about before we close. I think we can do that quickly. I want to share with you one of my documents. Um, I posted already on my website, but I would like to talk about that. Um, and I would like to look at the different breed traits. Um, sorry, and the different reasons why dogs get in disputes. Okay, let's make that a little bit bigger here so we can see it better. Here you go. I make it gigantic. Um, how do I make it better? How do I make the screen disappear? Up oh, here we go. So the first one that I usually see is excitement disputes. Yes. Okay. Too much excitement gets the dog to switch either to mating or hunting drive, humping or biting. Okay. In yep. this state, dogs like to control, hold, jump, and do things that can annoy the other mates or companions. Disputes can occur when the dog or other person resists or react about the state on the other dog is in. So for example, if we open the door, we come in, dogs get excited, the dog is jumping on me, that is unstable state of mind. That dog who is better educated, he will try to stop that from happening if you don't do that. And all of a sudden we have excitement dispute. Number two, frustration dispute. Despite the dog's efforts, if can't overcome obstacles, frustration can become destructive emotion. In fact, if frustration isn't dealt with efficiently and effectively, quickly it can become a trigger to negative emotional chain reaction, in which frustration leads to aggression and destructive behavior. Meaning is, if your dog is frustrated because of lack of justice, that can turn into aggression. He's going to attack the dog who doesn't behave accordingly. He's going to bite you because you have complied to a certain rules he expects you to do because of that frustration. And frustration can also be overcorrecting, right? And then we have possession disputes. It's mine or I'll die kind of situation, which sometimes could be post-traumatic stress disorder, sometimes could be health-related issue. But whoever that is, if the dog feels possession and he has to guard it at any cost and the other dog doesn't, doesn't prospect that, even though possession is a right of a dog to have, whatever is free, he can claim, and that claim is his, and nobody else should do, take it away, right? The possession disputes occur when the dog wants something another dog has, which is wrong, or protects his value item over another dog. The higher the perceived value, the likelier the feeling of losing it. Usually dogs with traumatic puppyhood or lack of socialization show tendency to get into disputes. This is what usually happens if also dogs are in survival mode because we have a roofer in the house, because the tree is being cut down in the yard, because somebody moved in our household, because we just adopted a dog. And if that dog feels that um, survival response kicking in because of his stress, possession disputes are more likely to happen. And then we have balance and rule disputes. We touched a little bit before. Dogs have high sense of justice. We know that, especially Mastiff or, you know, herding dogs and, and um, guardian dogs. They understand right from wrong based on how the partners react to certain situations. If the dog behaves unruly based on the pack's code of conduct, okay, then the dog who feels entitled will intervene and intend to stop it. You remember that dog intervening in your situation? Okay, he has high sense of balance and rules, so he steps in when he sees that is off the charts. And then, most likely, this going to happen is communication disputes, especially if you bring a dog in from a 
you know, valued breeder than you are in an existing home with existing dog who doesn't have these communication skills because he's never been proper socialized. And you bring that dog in your household, these dogs speak a different language, a slang. They usually understand each other, but likely sometimes not. And usually in the body language. And I know many people who says, oh, my dog is very well behaved because, you know, he does all these things with his military mates and he grew up with so many dogs in the household, but he never met a stranger dog. He speaks the house language, but he doesn't speak international, which puts him in a position, right? Even though dogs are genetic memory of their international language, social etiquette can only be learned through social interactions. So miscommunications are common cause of dispute in unsocialized dogs. So, anybody else has to ask any questions? I see what's going on here. You got interrupted. <laughs> yeah, I did. I had to take care of little Mumu, Harry. <laughs> so, back to the question, um, the difference between guardian and close guardians. For example, Alexander the Great has a close guardian and all his officers. That dog would make a distinction that his closed environment that he has to guard for, and that's it. He doesn't guard the whole town. He doesn't guard the whole flock of people. He guards his personal person. So I would say the difference between a close guardian and a guardian is the difference between a police officer and a personal bodyguard. What is your uh, perception? Joe? Well, you know, a close quarters guardian is usually uh, more of a tank type of dog, uh, tremendous mass, um, and body style not typically um, what you would think is something that could be a guardian per se out in war. Um, and, and like you said, Alexander the Great had personal dogs in his rooms that if someone entered that room, it would be disastrous and no force could stop this dog. And then on the other hand, he had mastiffs that would go out and hunt with them um which probably have a, a more in between uh kind of build where we've got um and and some some shape uh and stuff so i i think for me the difference would be a guardian um there's an estate guardian that that has a little bit more stamina and then there's a close quarter uh close quarters guardian which would be for indoors for the most part. Um, so one is more of an outdoor um, guardian and one is more of an indoor guardian. And that's kind of how I take it. Good. And as a closing question, um, season one, episode one kind of thing, I would say, um, ask, basically I would ask the question. Deb Jones disagrees with me. Go on it right now. I just see it. Deb Jones, I disagree, Joe. Oh, is that Joe? Oh, my mentor disagrees with me. Is that it? Let me let me block him. Wait, give me a second. <laughs> oh, that's it, Deb. I called you out. What do you disagree with me on? <laughs> I knew you'd show up. I love it. <clears throat> so, and basically closing our today's show and giving you a hint for the next show, what I think we should talk about going into the direction of how do we breed, how do we get a temperament that matches perfectly to what we expect of a mastiff are we expecting the right thing of a mastiff are we looking into the original breed traits of a mastiff or are we kind of all over the place um, and the today's last question would be basically um i know some people would get upset about that are mastiffs for everyone uh. Are masters for everyone? Well, yes and no. Um, there's probably breeds better suited for individual people, um, but I think a mastiff could suit anybody's needs. Um, there's there's always a mastiff for his particular needs. Kind of like we say in, in in Germany, there's always a beer for your specific flavor. So there is no person who doesn't like beer. He'd never have the right beer to taste. From a breed perspective, I would say um, knowing what you want as a person, knowing your family needs, being aware of what you're going to do the next 10 years of your life, 
yep. is how you make the choice whether or not a Mastiff is for your. Because here's an example. I want to downgrade from a 30-foot RV I'm living in into a 24-footer. Can I have a Mastiff's? No. He doesn't have a space in that room. Okay? It would be too tight to him. You know, all, all animals need a place to be left to half alone, the bark alone. All animals need a place to be left to bark alone, too. Exactly. Another Wait. question, for example, is I'm moving for another state. Is it okay for me to have a Mastiff? Well, where are you moving into? What are the expectations you're going into? You have a short metal Mastiff. You're moving to Arizona with 100 days of 110 degrees. Well, you know what? You're going to have a hard time with that dog. You will not be able to walk that dog throughout the day. You have to wake up in the morning, 5 o'clock, take him out for a walk, another time around 12 o'clock at night because the temperature is beyond 90. So what do you do with that? Okay. Right. You have to consider all that. And, and in a situation like that, my, my advice would be, why don't you get moved in and settled before you... Exactly. Dog and says, well, you know... I have yeah. Some barking people. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get over that. It's a great. I've, I've seen people who, who who arrive to adopt a mastiff, having a baby in a baby pen, in the back seat, and a second baby in the baby pen, in the second seat, and the husband and the wife. And I said, okay, now where do you put your mastiff? Um, yeah, I, having, I think we're going to rent a car. Having yeah. a, a young mastiff yeah. is having a newborn baby. So if you got you know young newborns and stuff. Again, my advice would be take care of your human child, and as he gets out of the water and growing a little bit, maybe consider getting them. people. They have a baby, and all of a sudden they want the, the uh, mastiff because you know they feel kind of entitled. If my wife has two children, I need a dog. Yeah, but I don't have time to take care of your dog, so my wife will take care of your dog since she is the one who raises children. She can raise the dog, and I'm out of the equation. I only need my dog if I come home having a beer and pet my dog on the head because I, that's what I do when I come home. You shouldn't have a mastiff. I don't no. think so. No, mastiff I, is think, no, I think a lot of people think you know this breed is is real suited for laying around. It doesn't seem to mind it and all that stuff, but um. You know, in the end, they're one of the most difficult breeds. They actually need exercise more than the smaller dogs daily. Um, and, you know, again, too, anytime that there's a vet situation, because of their size, it's quadruple in price. So you have to have that kind of in the background in case you need it. Um, you can't just be caught with your pants down with a 240-pound dog that needs care and not be able to do it. It's very important and so the bigger they are the harder they fall so to speak so you really got up they need more work than, than people realize one other thing i see people always um questioning that the rescues don't give them a mastiff because many people complain that they have to pay 250 dollars for a rescue and or they have to pay thousands yeah, for adoption. yeah you got no business you know and i say you know what how much money do you have in your bank account? Do you have $1,000 per dog in your bank account easily accessible? I was like, no. Well, do you know that if your dog swallows something he shouldn't, going to the vet to get it out of there, have you pay $500 down payment to even look at your dog while your dog is dying? And if you don't hold this $500, you will not save your dog. A lot of them now, Roman, need it all up front or they'll just simply say they won't even operate. And yeah. I've seen prices up to four grand to, to get a, um, a stuffy out of their guts. And yeah. if you don't have that and you're sitting there and I mean, what's the that's awful. So, yes, it, you know, every single, you know, bit of breeding and things that I do, I make sure that they're taken care of first. They work for them. That's where everything goes, right back to their quality of life, their food, their care, and be, being able to be ready at all times for a porcupine event or who right. knows. That's twelve hundred bucks if they get smacked in the face with a porcupine. So let me let me show you something here and I'll make it nice and bigger here. You see that? That's a yes, veal. I, yes, I certainly do. That's a whopper. That's a dandy. You see that price here? Six hundred seven dollars. 
for four hours for a 12 pound chihuahua yep. carry. Oops, yep. sorry. If, if that was a mastiff, you could quadruple that. And my dog wasn't dying. Well, he was feeling very sick. So I had to go to the vet. Okay. If I didn't have the $600, I wouldn't get my dog back. Nope. How simple is that? Or, okay. or the dog I, would, I yeah. wasn't done yet because then I had to do a follow up. Okay. Because I needed my dog to go and get some additional information, which gave me to another cost of $32 food and um, $300 of another exam. So I'm close to $1,000 and basically I'm not 100% sure what my dog has. So can you afford the Mastiff? I would say even if you have those $2,000 in your bank account and you have a vet who has no clue about Mastiffs, there's another problem right there. Yes, it's hard to find a vet that has experience with Mastiffs. Because that dog is going to die on your vet's desk. Yeah. I know of a specific situation where one ha uh, had eaten a stuffed animal and the vet refused the surgery and euthanized the dog instead. And uh, I, I, if I was a vet and went into that field, I certainly wouldn't practice that way. Yeah, I would have offered a payment something, but they don't. They, they Vets have been screwed over so bad by people because they feel they can rack these bills and it's not – you know, they're not human. I can screw them over that they kind of had to do what they did. So nowadays you pay up front or you don't even get the service. Uh, I agree. I'm not blaming the vets. I'm just saying. I'm not uh, either. I'm not either. Uh, um, if you're a, a Mastiff or a caretaker. I'm not a vet. I wouldn't make any money. I'd work for free all night long trying to help dogs and I'd end up going broke and I'd not be a vet very long. And that's a fact. I do it. You know, if you knew how many hours a day I spend answering questions to people, that just want to better the lives of their dog. And I try to answer every single solitary one because it's not about, it's about the dog. And it's about, like you said, teaching the owners just as much as training the dog. So. So, and we're coming to our end today for our first kind of like more specific direction. Um, I've got some wonderful people that I would like to have on here coming up. Lalo Tell BG. Me about that. Yeah, uh, I've, I've spoken with I've spoken with Lalo BG. Um, he kind of does what I do in Mexico. Um, just an unbelievable guy when it comes to Mastiff knowledge. Been doing this as long as I can remember, um, and has a very good name in the Mastiff community. Um, and he's an invaluable resource. And I've we've been talking on our own, wanting to do. Uh, a talk, do a discussion or a show. So um, yeah. we're, we're going to try to get Lalo on. Um, he did say he would do a show. He tried to make it today and couldn't. Um, yeah. And then uh, Alicia Pledger is a breeder I work pretty closely with um, that has agreed to come on at some point, which would, should be very interesting when that day comes. Yeah. I'm still working on my reproduction vet. Um, she, you know, being a vet and a professional in the business and as busy as she is, it's very hard to nail somebody down but if in the future i can get her on i'd really like to do that yeah. too and we're not talking about general breeders we talk about married breeders we talk about breeders yeah. who want to preserve the breeds want to keep the breed healthy and we want to uh, make sure that we're not supporting whatever breeders um we you are know, supporting if, rescues. If you see a breeder that just simply decides upon themselves that I don't need to health test this dog for severe genetic problems like hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, patella, thyroid, uh, and you can go on. But there's some major ones that, I mean, if you at least don't have hips, elbows, and some genetic tests, you have business doing this. Um, anybody with today's technology not do it. And I've heard excuses from you know you'll get people that didn't do hips and say well he was hit uh, hit by a car when he was young. Mm. just uh you know i wouldn't be dealing with that i i mean if you can't at least do show the people that hey i put a lot of thought and effort into trying to better this breed or at least maintain its integrity um 
then you shouldn't be doing it. So uh, if you're, if that's a clear sign that you're not willing to invest on the dog's behalf. So that's how I feel. Thank you so much for all the information and super awesome. Thank you for all your questions. Um, let's meet next Saturday, um, a little bit earlier though. Um, I would love to. And um, let's uh, continue our conversation, better understanding how do we get the Mastiff to be a Mastiff? How do we choose um, appropriate rescue to get a Mastiff? How do we choose appropriate breeder to get a Mastiff? Do we just go out there and shop whatever we get at the lowest possible price? That's or do we have to look for specific informations? Uh, we will have specialists, we will have professionals um, who have lots of knowledge in the chapter. We're, we're just dads talking about mast having mastiffs and talking about dogs here. However, we have a little bit of a background, right? My favorite part of this show is <laughs> it's the coffee. dads hanging out, having our coffee and keeping it keeping it real. Um, we, I, we'd like to keep things simple. We're not going ultra spiritual, ultra scientific, or ultra, you know, vulgar. Uh, but we want people by the end of the show and says, you know what? I got something out of it. That was my takeaway. And you're welcome to share that with you. If you ever guys have a takeaway of what you learned today, why don't you put it in the comments and we can answer it next time. You know so that. thank you guys for watching everyone. This is um, Joe and Roman, Mastiff Dads, having coffee, talking about dogs. Thank you, Roman.